Hello, welcome to State of the Division, this time bringing you the big 3 double O. UFC 300 has arrived, and with it comes one hell of a fight card. With a loaded early prelim that brings some really fun fighters that normally would never even touch an early prelim, an exciting prelim card, and besides Bo Nickel, a great main card. I have no reason to be disappointed by anything on this card, and despite my initial kind of like, oh, that's the main event, and I got no reason to be disappointed by anything on this card, except the fact that I might miss some of it. That being said, let's jump into the housekeeping. On the last card, I went eight and seven. Not too bad, not too great. I will admit a lot of my failing was looking at 50-50 fights and kind of just going, all right, maybe this guy, instead of looking a little deeper, I did fall into the Halton Almeida trap and I should have probably picked Curtis Blades there. That did cost me a win I think I should have had, but I'll take an eight and seven to bring me to 23, 16 and one on the year. At the time of recording, the butcher's bill is non-existent. I did hear rumors of scheduling conflicts and things like that, but nothing was confirmed and might have also been things leading up to the fight that were resolved. All that being said, let's jump right in. Kicking off the milestone, 22-3-1, Devison, Deus de Guerrero Figueredo, looks for two in a row against 14-5, Cody No Love Garbrandt. Garbrandt is four years younger at 32, three or two inches taller, because they can't agree still, with Figueredo taking a definite three in reach. Figueredo is a strong fighter with a definite finish ability, and despite it not coming out in his last few fights, well, since 2020 really, in the numbers he runs with a 308 to 346 in striking, and while his last KO win was in 2018, his power still allows him to generate knockdowns in addition to being able to flip an exchange in an instant. On that same hand, I do feel he doesn't have the greatest variety of strikes, but is able to match a lot of his opponents to not be left behind in exchanges. In terms of takedowns, he carries a 1.65 and the ability to stack them in most of his fights. And while he is able to control and grind his opponents into oblivion, four minutes of ground control against Rob Font, he often uses those takedowns to set up his submission game, of which he he has eight career wins that way. Garbrandt is coming in off a two fight win streak and seems to have found his stride in a new weight class. He still very much sits as a striker, a 306 to 3.91 with a decent variety of strikes and some knockout ability in his arsenal. I'm admittedly not willing to say it's so much straight power as timing and shot choice, but nonetheless, he can put his opponents away. In terms of takedowns, he rocks a 1.10, which just highlights some adaptability and matchup decisions based on his opponents and their skill sets. Figueredo is the Vegas pick and I will agree. One part of it is blatant favoritism, I can't really deny that. The other part of it is that I think Figueredo's power, as I've termed it, and his more aggressive ground game, that submission threat, and his ability a lot of times to match in exchanges. Could Cody put him away? Yes. But I just think Figueredo has the equalizer on his end in the power. I think he's been able to match elusive fighters before. He stepped in with elusive fighters, and he's lost on points. I think this is a fight that he can win and put Cody on the back foot or put him on the ground and take advantage from there. 31, 15, one and one. Bobby King Green looks for the rebound against a 37, 17, zero oh and one. Jim A10 Miller. Green is somehow three years younger at 37, two inches taller with dead even reach across the board. Green is a striker with finishability in spades and there's not much else I can say. In the numbers he runs with a 6.14 to 3.74 in striking which highlights his ability to pour it on and steal the massive striking leads even in losses. 137 to 54 against Ferguson and 73 to 34 against Dober. It is worth noting that he is susceptible to being caught on the feet and against power punchers he has tended to struggle. It is worth noting he is susceptible to being caught on the feet and against power punchers he does tend to struggle meaning he has a tendency to get knocked out in certain exchanges. He does rock a 1.20 takedown average though that is entirely situational and based on the opponent and the matchup as he hasn't landed a takedown since 2020. He does have submission ability but it's based off reversals or takedown defense less so than him initiating the setup for it. Miller is a different story altogether with a focus on the submission and ground game with a 1.58 takedown average and a potent submission game with two in his last four fights ending that way. He doesn't tend to rack up mass takedowns, but he makes use of a limited amount landed to secure control time or submissions. In terms of striking, he does have finish ability and power, but does only carry a 296 to 3.18 in striking, which highlights his tendency to wade into firefights and exchange versus avoid any real damage. Vegas is taking Bob and Green and being boring, I have to agree. On the feet, Bobby Green definitely has the advantage and Miller is not much of a power puncher, which gives him a big advantage because that's his big weakness on the feet. On the flip side, if it goes to the ground, I do have to give it to Miller, but Bobby Green is pretty solid on the ground. He's not amazing, but I imagine that 
both fighters being up there in age, Miller might be able to avoid the ground long enough, keep it on the feet, or have enough rounds on the feet that the points are going to fall his way if he doesn't get the finish. 25-15. Jessica Bateastaka, I think I said that right, Andrade looks to keep winning against 17-3-1. Marina Rodriguez. Andrade is four years younger, five, possibly four, inches shorter, with six inches in reach, going to Rodriguez. Andrade is coming off a win, but it is worth noting that win did break up a three-fight losing streak. But to actually look at her style, she comes across as a finisher, but more on the swarming quantity side of finishing, not so much straight power shot. In the numbers, she racks a 6.67 to 5.39 in striking, and oftentimes will outstrike her opponents by a solid margin. 231 to 100 against Murphy, 48 to 27 against Cavillo. She does have a takedown game that sits at 2.45 in addition to submission ability, but it is used a bit more sparingly with different preference for matchup and opponent preference. Rodriguez is a remarkably similar story in the numbers with a 477 to 289 in striking, but while she does finish in the same style as Andrade, Rodriguez tends to end up grinding on the feet more, putting her opponent on the back foot. She doesn't shoot takedowns as often in comparison, but she also does tend to grind more in that aspect as well, but in the end there's a different preference for the feet. Faze takes Rodriguez by a narrow margin, and I have to, by a narrow margin, and by narrow I mean minus 115 to minus 105. And quite frankly, I will agree. It's not that I think Andrade can't win, I just think Rodriguez has been remarkably more consistent as of recently compared to Andrade. Could Andrade be starting a hot streak? Yes, but based on what, I've, what I looked at writing this, I give the edge to Rodriguez. While Andrade has the higher striking numbers, Rodriguez has proven to be able to hang in there with almost any fighters while also being able to match a lot of people. And while both fighters have a ground game, you have the grinding style, the consistent takedowns, the consistent push that you get with Rodriguez versus Andrade, who again, has seemed a little hot and cold. Ending off our early prelims, 14 and seven, Jalen, the Tarantula Turner, looks to roll to two in a row against 18, five and one, Renato Moicano. Turner is six years younger, four inches taller, with a whole five inches in reach, also rolling his way. Turner is a finisher through and through with 10 career KO wins, four submission wins, and every single one of his UFC wins coming by finish. In striking here, he's a 602 to 463 and power in spades. He does tend to take the striking lead in his wins, but to the degree of the lead does vary on the fight, with some being 55-12 and others being 9-3. Obviously, being a finisher does screw with those numbers a little, but it is still something worth looking at. In takedowns, he has a .88, but it's very inconsistent with its appearance in his fights. Feels like a matchup decision, but he can be aggressive with it or use it for recovery. It's a tool in his toolbox. Now, he does have a submission game that does tend to follow his takedowns, but as seen against Riddle, it isn't always necessary. Moicano is also a finisher, but one of a different flavor with 10 career submission wins and six of those in the UFC. Runs with a 1.80 on takedowns and can either pour on the takedowns to rack up swaths of control time or take it to the submission off a single take. Additionally, he doesn't always need a takedown for submission, but he does tend to have those go hand in hand. Striking is okay with a 4-4-1 to 3.80, but really serves to keep him in the fight and get it to the ground at some point. His weakness is seen with higher level strikers who have taken him to task, but He's also matched up with a lot of very good strikers on the same hand. Turner's the heavy favorite, and I will agree. I think it's a little closer than it actually is, as there's a definite chance for Moicano to win. But Turner has the definite power advantage. Turner is the definitely the better striker. But Moicano has the definitely better ground game. So does this fight go to the ground is the big decider. And on that end, Turner does have a 75% takedown defense and has to know the game plan for Moicano coming in. So I think this fight likely stays on the feet for most of it, which is Turner's wheelhouse, which is where he wants to be and is where he can put you away. So Makano has a task set up for him that I think is a lot harder than what Turner has to do to win. Kicking off the prelims, 13 and three, Sadiq Super Yuso. So sorry. Looks for the rebound win against 23 and six, Diego Lopez. Lopez is one year younger at 29, two inches taller with one inch in reach, also going his way. Yusuf is a fighter I can best describe as a grinder. Though he does have six career KO wins and two finished wins, one by each method in the UFC. Still, he predominantly does rely on dictating pace and keeping the entire fight on the feet. That note, a 5.72 to 4.33 is what he carries in the striking, which does speak to his tendency of meeting opponents on the feet. He can pull away and has done so against the likes of Andre Feely and Shaman Moraes, but in his last two wins, they've been much closer, striking 9-3 against Sheamus and 64-66 against Caceres. He does have a .28 takedown average, 
average, but it entirely seems like a situational choice for small chunks of control. Lopez is relatively new to the UFC with only four fights, that's including a contender series fight, but is a finisher through and through so far with a combined 21 finish wins, 9 KO, and 12 submission. Now the numbers are a little misleading, but on the feed he carries a 247 to 491, which is mostly weighed down by his loss to Mosfar Evelev and Joe Anderson Brito, where he was outstruck severely. In his wins, he's either landed no strikes and secured the submission, or took a striking lead and put it away on the feed. He does carry a 0.00 takedown average, which does not highlight his ability to play off his back or off his opponent's offense. Vegas takes Lopez by a narrow margin. I'm going to disagree. Lopez is dangerous. He can put a fight away in an instant, and he's proven his ability to do that. But looking at this fight, Yusef has just this ability that I like more here to dictate pace, to dictate flow, to keep a fight going in a direction that he wants. If Lopez takes him down and controls him there, fight swings hard. But Lopez doesn't shoot a lot of takedowns. We're going against someone who doesn't shoot a lot of takedowns, so it's probably going to stay on the feet. And Yusef has proven the ability to manage fights on the feet. I 100% think Lopez can win. I think don't think there's a bad reason to assume he won't. But in this fight, choosing Yusef makes more sense to me. Makes more sense to me, at least, just for his ability to dictate pace and dictate offense of his opponents given his grinding style. 15-6-0-1, oh, Holly, the preacher's daughter home, looks to welcome the UFC newcomer. 16-1, Kayla Harrison. Harrison is nine years younger at 33, Jesus, dead even in height, with no ideas on reach, Home does have a 69 inch reach. Now firstly, I have never heard Holly Home in my life called the preacher's daughter. I am convinced that is made up, because I swear to God I've watched her fight and never heard a ring announcer call her the preacher's daughter. Anyway, focusing on things that matter. She definitely is a grinder who excels at controlling the fight and keeping the pace in her wheelhouse. In the numbers, she works with a 3 one to 2 7 9 in striking, which does speak to her tendency to slow the fight down and strangle her opponent's offense throughout the fight. She can generate KO power, but her last KO came in 2017, so it's safe to say it's more of a wild card shot than it is a consistent thing to look out for. On the ground, she shows her controlling, controlling style a bit more with a point 0.90 takedown average and tends to stack takedowns when given the chance. Obviously, she generates control time off it, but there are times that other opponents steal the takedown and take her down instead. Now, Harrison is a PFL veteran making her way over after a solid run in the promotion, one I really should have looked at more and actually probably pay attention more to. That being said, I don't have full access to a numbered stat list, but in her career, she works with six KO wins, six submission wins, and four decision, with her only loss coming this by decision as well. Now, she is, was a world champion judo competitor, I'm not quite sure the terminology there before entering MMA and did bring those skills over into the PFL where she was able to take fighters down and secure submissions. Can't speak to the strength of her takedown game or striking, but I can say she's been able to generate power on the feet and put her opponents away when needed or given the chance. Vegas takes Harrison. I'm going to take the shot and roll with Holmes here. Now this is favoritism pure and simple. Holmes has been a fighter I've seen growing up, never called the preacher's daughter, but she's a fighter I've kind of grown up watching. She's a fighter I've not followed, but I've kind of seen in the UFC. And I'm kind of betting that she's gonna come out like a bat out of hell. She's gonna come out with a dog at her or any other cliche you wanna throw there. And I'm hoping to catch Harrison off guard. And I feel like Holm just has a little bit of magic in her to do it. This is not a technical analysis for this one. I'm picking Holm out of favoritism and kind of the hope that the old dog has a few more tricks in her to win this fight. 23 and 7, Calvin, the Boston finisher Qatar, looks to stop his skid against the former champion, the Funk Master. 23 and 4, Al Jermaine Sterling. Sterling is two years younger at 34, four inches shorter, with a single inch in reach, going to Qatar. Qatar is a high octane fighter who pushes pace and puts a whole lot of pressure on his opponents. Striking is his definite preference with a 5.12 to 7.0 in the numbers, though that absorbed number is weighed down by the hallway loss, where 445 strikes were landed against him. Jesus. Otherwise, the striking is very good and consistently he's able to match or surpass his opponents unless their name is Holloway. Naka Power is a bit absent as of late with his last win by KO being four years ago. Carries a .42 takedown average, but it is something he very much calls on when the matchup is favorable to his takedowns, and if it isn't, he just probably won't shoot them. A situational recovery-based technique. Sterling is Sterling and is a definite control-based fighter with a dangerous takedown and ground game. In that regard, he rolls with 1.97 takedown average, and while he doesn't always shoot a mass amount of takedowns, he capitalizes off a limited amount to drive up a control time total and limit his opponent's ability to do offense. He also is willing to shoot on anyone and match fighters with solid ground games there as well. Now when striking, he runs with a 4.73 to 2.41, though part of that is ground strikes, which does reflect some of the fights where he has struggled on the feet and relied on the ground game to take the edge. Additionally, he is susceptible to being caught on the feet, as 
when he lost to O'Malley. O'Malley caught him with the perfect shot. I assume he'll have worked on that aspect of the game, decision making, keeping his vision open, whatever you want to call it. But it is worth noting he has been caught like that. Vegas takes Sterling and I will agree. This is entirely based on Sterling's ground game and control time. And while Qatar is good, Sterling's gone up against fighters with pretty good ground games, pretty good defenses, and he's racked up chunks of control time. And with a fighter like Qatar, who's high octane, the chances of catching him in a bad move, putting him on the ground and getting him to scramble, it's not exactly awful for Sterling. Qatar's looking to land heavy on the feet early, and Sterling's not bad at working. Sterling's not awful at working on the feet. He does not amazing, but he's good enough to try to set up his ground game and put him in a position to use his skill set to win. Taking us out of the prelims. Former champ, 29 and 4. Jiri, BJP Proschaka, which I said wrong, looks to get back into contention against 14 and 3, Alexander Rocket Rejic. Jiri is one year younger, one inch shorter, but two inches in reach, do roll his way. Jiri is a kill to be killed finisher and a dangerous one at that with 25 career KO wins and three finished wins in the UFC out of four fights. Two KO, one submission. Now his striking is the main focus with a 5 3 1 to 5 1 7, which just speaks to his admittedly very wild style where he wades into fire and trades with his opponents. It has approved a little bit when it comes to the chin being out but still a great deal of trading involved. Obviously his power and variety of possible strikes make up for it and give him a slight advantage but it's still a bit of a hole. Takedown set of a 0.61 average and it seems to be a solid tool that he can rely on if not one he pulls out often. Rejic is almost the complete opposite style of fighter. Instead of a high octane finisher, he relies more on a grinding style of striking mixed in with huge swaths of control time. In the striking, he does carry a 401 to 230 and does a very good job at managing his opponents, if not outright outpacing them on the feet. He doesn't tend to take large, large striking totals, but does just enough to edge out his opponents. In terms of the ground game, carries a 0.82 average, but does not need takedowns to generate control time. Against Anthony Smith, he secured zero takedowns and racked up 12 minutes of control time. And in most of his fights, he does have some sort of control time which means he wants to slow down his opponent's offense and trap them in his pace on his terms. Vegas takes Rachel by a narrow margin which makes sense given how close this fight is at least on paper and because of how close it is on paper I'm gonna roll with Jiri. I think Jiri's gone up against fighters who are fairly good on the ground. Admittedly he hasn't fought in the UFC a lot but I think Jiri is gonna be able to at least survive Rachel on the ground and take him back to the feet or he's going to prevent Rachich from fully getting him down and keeping in positions where he can strike at him. And I think Jiri has the power advantage here. Yes, he's willing to exchange more, but with his power and the variety of strikes he tends to throw, I think the striking becomes a dangerous place for Rachich to be, and it's there that I'm going to give Jiri the edge, assuming the fight stays on the feet. Kicking off the main card for some reason. 5-0 Bo Nickel looks to stay perfect against the challenger 10-5 Cody Brundage. The Nickel is one year younger at 28, even height or one inch going to Nickel, with four in reach definitely going his way as well. Now, to avoid complaining more about Nickel being on the main card, he's a finisher with a definite preference for the ground with three submission wins. In terms of numbers, he does rock a 11.04 in takedowns, which just misrepresents it a little bit given he has four total takedowns in the UFC, with every fight with a takedown resulting in a submission win. I do have questions against fighters with great takedown defense or good ground game, but I don't really feel that question stands here. In striking, carries a 276 to 0.55 with noticeable KO power, though I'm not sure how consistent it is compared to his submission game. Now, Brundage has only won four of his nine UFC fights. From what I can note, he is a killer be killed fighter. Seems to be decently rounded in terms of, of how he can finish a fight, but in the numbers, we see him struggle a bit. In striking, carries a 1.80 to 2.51 with a 2.59 takedown average, which is pretty good, but we see him several times land takedowns, but have the position reversed or even countered with his opponents taking control and getting the finish. Vegas takes nickel by a heavy, heavy, heavy margin, and I will agree with a little hesitation. Brundage has not had a great UFC run, as I said, four of nine UFC wins. Nickel's great on the ground, Brundage isn't. Brundage, if he keeps it on the feet and swings for high heaven, has a chance, but Brundage's chance is a much longer shot than Nickel securing a takedown, securing a submission. Brundage needs a Hail Mary, Nickel needs a two yard out route. 34, 9, 0, oh, and 1. Charles Du Bronx Oliveira looks to re enter the title picture with a win against. For Armand Sarukian, who sits at number 14. Halkala Katz Sarukian. Armand is seven years younger, does give up three inches in height and two inches in reach. Now, Oliveira doesn't need a whole lot of introduction if you follow the UFC, but for the sake of pride, who justified the existence of this video and this segment, 
the numbers. Stylistically, Oliveira is a finisher with a definite preference for the ground and a dangerous grappling game he's able to use in a, to end a fight in an instant. In terms of the grounding rest with a 2.32 takedown average, and as mentioned, he's able to make use of submission game to end a fight quick, but also can generate swaths of control time to tip scorecards his way. He also doesn't always need a takedown and has shown the ability to capitalize off knockdowns or even simply taking advantage of his opponent's position. Striking carries a 3.54 to 3.19, which does speak to a tendency to rely on the ground and work towards getting there, but he's been able to at least match his opponents. He does possess KO ability, but it always feels like a timing and mo movement based shot over a power shot. Armand, because I can't say his last name, also comes across as a finisher, but instead of submission, he's also much more of a striker, with four of his last seven ending by KO. In the numbers, he rolls with a 3.85 to 1.91 in striking and the obvious KO power I've talked. This is backed up by a 3.40 takedown average that he makes great use of to control his opponents and rack up huge chunks of control time. It is worth noting he has struggled against opponents capable of securing curing chunks of control as well. Vegas takes Armand, and honestly, this is a hard one. A part of me wants to run with Armand. I don't think it's a bad pick. And I'm trying to talk myself into it as I record this. But I think here, I'm gonna run with Oliveira. I'm doing my whole veteran experience thing again. Where I think Oliveira has faced a level of competition I'm not sure Armand has. We've seen Oliveira make adjustments to heavy strikers, people who outpace him on the feet. We've seen him land the perfect shot when needed or force someone to think about two parts of their game at once and give him the opportunity he needs to step in, secure a takedown, or land a shot that'll tip the scorecards his way. I could easily see Armand win, but in this matchup, I think Oliveira has the slight edge in terms of experience and adaptability of his game. 25 and 4, Justin, the highlight Gaethje, looks to defend his BMF belt against 25 and 7, Max Blessed Holloway, who is coming up a weight class for this fight. Holloway is in fact three years younger, with dead even height and a whole one inch of reach rolling to Gaethje. Gaethje is a high octane striker capable of putting his opponents away in a heartbeat or dragging them into the deep end with a hellacious pace. To put it in numbers, he racks a 7.35 to 7.50 in striking, which does highlight his tendency to swang and bang, though in those exchanges he has tended to come out on top. He also does have a great strike variety and a dangerous calf kick that I feel like I have to mention here. Now he does technically have a ground game with a .13 takedown average and one attempted takedown in the UFC, but more importantly to Gaethje's style is the takedown defense which sits at a 75% and he has used it to great effect. And when taken down, most of the time he's been able to get back to his feet. Holloway is a similar in style, with the main difference being he is less of a swang and bang fighter, but he can still go that way. You look at his numbers, he carries a 7.17 to 4.75 in striking, highlighting the difference in striking defense. And that striking, and with that striking defense, it plays a great role in him being able to dictate pace and style of his fight, putting his opponents behind early and forcing them to play catch up while he kind of coasts and is able to measure out distance more and make more decisions. Does also have a .27 takedown average and occasionally has been able to shoot takedowns to good effect as seen against Jair Rodriguez, but given the very sparing nature of his takedowns, it very much is a situational matchup decision. Vegas likes Gaethje by a narrow margin, a running theme on this card. And while I'd love to pick Holloway here, I'm gonna have to go with Gaethje. I think Gaethje has the advantage of this being his weight class, the one he fights at normally. Holloway is coming up. And while Holloway has the better striking defense, fighters with striking defense have not mattered to Gaethje. He's, waged, he's walked into fire, he's waged war, and he's matched pace. And with Gaethje's power punches, Holloway just putting up better numbers might not be good because if Gaethje lands his one shot, Holloway might get put away. And while Holloway's got a good chin, you are going up a weight class fighting someone who normally fights at this weight class. I think it'll be a great fight, and I am going to give it to Gaethje kind of based off this is his weight class, and his power is a little greater than Holloway's. For our first title fight, for the women's 115-pound belt, the champion, 24-3, Zhang Magnum Welly looks to extend her defense streak to three against the challenger. 18-3, zero and one, Yan Fury Xiao Nan. Even age across the board, one inch in height going to Xiao Nan, and reach coming to a dead draw. Zhang is a very well-rounded fighter capable of finishing and honestly seems to alternate between controlling her opponents and putting them away. The numbers do show this with a 5.94 to 3.44 in striking, showing her ability to manage her opponents on the feet. And this is in addition to a very nice striking variety that mixes in spinning strikes to good effect. Now, her takedown game backs this all up and gives her another tool to disrupt her opponent's offense or generate mass amounts of control time. 
and the 2.29 average does highlight this and also serves to set up her submission game. But on that note, she doesn't always need takedowns to do that and can work off opponent's misplays or their takedowns as well. Xiao Nan is very similar in the numbers, but is a much, much more of a grinder in comparison, taking the fight the distance without getting the finish as often. Striking, she carries a 5.55 to a 3.56 and tends to pull ahead in terms of the striking numbers, though she has been outstruck pretty bad in two of her losses, 72 to 56 and 27 to 5. Her takedowns sit at a 0.86 and she definitely can pour it on and rack up chunks of control time, but it's again, much more of a situational. Worth noting is that she has proven the ability to secure control time off others' takedowns or even without takedown. She also is a very tough fighter having only been finished once in the UFC. Vegas takes Zhang for this and I'm going to agree. Xiao Nan has a path to victory, but once again, I've used this analogy before, her path's a bit twistier than Zhang's. I think Zhang's path coming into this is a bit more clear. She has a very broad skill set that I think can go to places Xiao Nan isn't as good and force her into positions that she doesn't want to fully be in. And because of thinking of it like that, I have to give the edge to Zhang here, and I think Zhang's going to take it. For the main event and the 205 pound belt. 9 and 2, Alex Poetan Pereira looks to defend his belt against the former champ, 12 and 1, Jamal Sweet Dreams Hill. Hill is four years younger with dead even height and dead even reach. Poetan is a thoroughbred finisher with seven career KO wins and four of them in the UFC. Mostly a striker given the kickboxing background and he really excels in that part of the game with a five flat to three six five. This is in addition to his KO power and solid strike variety that can hang with a lot of other fighters in the 205 weight class. Now in terms of takedowns, he has landed and shot one against Israel Adesanya and not much else, but more importantly to his style is a 70% takedown defense and solid recovery ability to get back to his feet when taken down, which is something he has had to use. Hill is remarkably similar in terms of style. A high octane striking focus finisher. However, the numbers are a bit different. 7.31 to 3.35 in striking, and the ability to pour these massive striking leads against certain opponents. He also does possess knockout power in spades, but does have a slightly less varied striking style, still very dynamic, however. In terms of the ground game, he tends to keep it on the feet with a shocking 0.00 takedown average and a similar 73% takedown defense. Vegas likes Poetan by a narrow margin. And deciding live, I'm going to disagree. Poetan's an amazing striker. He's very skilled at striking. He is going up against Jamal Hill, who's fought at this level before. He's another very good striker. And while I think Poetan might be technically better, I think Hill has the same power. And if I remember correctly, Hill has not been knocked out in the UFC yet. We've seen Poetan go to sleep. Now, Poetan could easily win this. Poetan could probably knock Hill out with how he fights. But looking at this, I think Hill has a very good shot given that he is a very similar fighter. He doesn't want to go to the ground. He pours on the pace of striking and can at least match Poetan to where it's going to come down to the dynamic ability of their striking and their ability to either outlast or take the initiative from their opponent. With all that said and done, those were my picks and my sort of analysis for UFC 300. And as I said, it's a great card. There's... A lot of fun fights from top to bottom. You have a lot of people trying to re-enter the challenging picture. A lot of people trying to reassert themselves as members of a division. A lot of people stepping up, fighting for belts, or looking at that title picture right on the outside of it. This is a card that will have a lot of implication. It's a card that's going to, I think, set up matchups further down the year, even into next year. But all that being said, this has been State of the Division. Thank you for watching. Go ahead and leave your picks down below. Go ahead and tell me how you did from the last cards and have a great fight.